In a long form video a few months ago, we described Anakin Skywalker as one of Star Wars' most complex characters, a character with humanity and complexity that defies classification. The same isn't entirely true for the character we'll be discussing today. Darth Sidious fits pretty neatly into the archetype of the being of pure evil. But Sidious too is an extremely complex character. He was a man of many faces, Senator, Sith Lord, Chancellor, Emperor. He was a master of manipulation and deceit, weaving webs of lies and hiding his unquenchable bloodthirst behind the mask of a kindly old man. Much like Anakin Skywalker, it can be difficult to discern who he really was and what he really believed in, especially from the films alone. Today, with the help of a few Legends novels, we're going to be unmasking the true face of Palpatine, the avatar of the dark side. Looking for an extra dose of sci-fi to satiate your inner strategist? Love cute pixel art and fun games that don't bombard you with microtransactions? Love a passionate and dedicated development team that provides consistent updates? Well, then look no further than Pixel Starships. Pixel Starships is a spaceship micromanagement game based in an 8-bit massive online universe that lets you command every aspect of your ship, from construction to battles to crew members to mining all in a single persistent world. As a massive fan of pixel art myself, as well as the general spacey theme, being a Star Wars fan of course, I've enjoyed every hour spent on this game so far, and I have to say the best part for me is the competitive aspect, which lets me see how good the designing and strategizing of my ship has been against the wider community. But this just honestly scratches the surface, and if you want a non-pay to win, awesome looking mobile game, you found it in Pixel Starships. Pixel Starships truly is a flavor for all types of gamers, and if you want a more PvE exploration experience, the game also has you covered with unique missions, space exploration, and more. So be sure to choose your Pixel Starships faction today and conquer your enemies and alien species with your superior Starship design. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? Be sure to click my link in the description below and get 100 Starbucks upon joining. Before we begin, we've got some more recommended reading for you guys. As with our video on Anakin Skywalker, we're going to be quoting Matthew Stover's Revenge of the Sith novelization a fair bit today, though not as much as the Anakin video. Additionally, we'll be drawing quite a bit on James Luceno's novel Darth Plagueis. As before, we encourage you to purchase and read both of these books if you can spare the money. Both books are amazing and their authors deserve all the love and support you can give them. Without further ado, let's begin. During the Clone Wars, the fate of the Galactic Republic rested on the fate of one man, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Once, he had been the senator for the Chommel Sector, a moderate considered to be a voice of reason by his peers. He had been propelled to the top spot in Republic government by a wave of sympathy over the invasion of his homeworld and the other senators' beliefs that he would be easy to influence. But as Supreme Chancellor, Palpatine proved to be the opposite. He instead developed a reputation as a resolute, principled man who wouldn't stand for the corruption of the Senate. As the novelization puts it, Palpatine of Naboo is the most admired man in the galaxy whose unmatched political skills have held the Republic together, whose personal integrity and courage prove that the separatist propaganda of corruption in the Senate is nothing but lies. But this was a mask, a lie in itself, it wasn't who Palpatine really was. After the Clone Wars, Palpatine ruled the galaxy as Emperor. The Republic became his empire and he became a symbol of order and strength. He was the firm hand that guided the empire, the wise ruler who knew what was best for the galaxy, the ultimate example for adherence of the new order that humanity was destined to rule over all others. He was a dictator, to be sure, and his edicts could be harsh, but even many of his critics would admit that the Emperor had a plan for the galaxy. Decades after his death, his supporters endured, claiming that Palpatine had been building the Empire to steal the galaxy against invaders from beyond. This was also a mask. The Emperor was not who Palpatine was either. To others, the man the galaxy called Palpatine was known as Darth Sidious. It was a name given to him by his master, who saw him as the perfect politician, a partner who would help him make the Jedi obsolete. When Sidious himself became the master, one of his apprentices saw him as a solution to the galaxy's problems, while the other saw him as his only true ally against a galaxy of betrayers. But these were lies too, 
projections that Sidious accepted to cloak his true self. Behind these masks, the true face of Palpatine was far simpler. Palpatine was a shadow, the embodiment of the dark side. To again quote the novelization, the simmering jewelscape of Coruscant haloed the knife-edged shadow of the chair. Within the chair's shadow sat another shadow, deeper, darker, formless, and impenetrable, an abyssal umbra so profound it drained lights from the room around it, and from the city, and the planet, and the galaxy. Only Sidious's fellow Sith came close to understanding Palpatine as he really was. To those he named Tyrannus and Vader, Lord Sidious's true essence was visible through the dark side of the Force. To quote the novelization one last time, and then there was Palpatine of course. He was beyond power. He showed nothing of what might be within. But seen within the eyes of the dark side itself, Palpatine was an event's horizon. Beneath his entirely ordinary surface was absolute, perfect nothingness. Darkness beyond darkness. A black hole in the Force. It was something Darth Plagueis had also observed many decades before. The galaxy only saw Palpatine through the many masks he wore to fit into galactic society, to impress and intimidate and manipulate beings to his own ends. As we mentioned before, none of these were Palpatine's true self. His true self was much more lacking. He was utterly empty, not just a being of darkness, but a being of nothingness, a swarming mass of rage and hatred with no true center. He spent his life hiding it, but in secret, he came to embrace it. To understand it, to understand Palpatine, we must begin there with his initial journey down the dark road. Palpatine was a child of privilege, born into a powerful aristocratic family on Naboo, and in his youth especially, he acted like it. He was the oldest child of the powerful nobleman Cosigna Palpatine, and from the moment of his birth, his father knew there was something different about him. As the boy matured, it became evident that he was brilliant and highly skilled, but the younger Palpatine's prospects were complicated by his open disdain for authority. Palpatine knew he was smart, he knew he had skill, and he knew deep down that he had power within him beyond any of his family. His father, an aggressive, arrogant man who detested insubordination, openly despised his son, and his son reciprocated. The boy refused to acknowledge the name his father had given him as a sign of disrespect, simply choosing to go by Palpatine. Palpatine was not only openly insubordinate, but also mischievous and misanthropic. He hated those he saw as lesser than him, which was pretty much everyone, especially his father who he saw as an incompetent blowhard, which was an accurate assessment to be fair. He routinely caused trouble purely to spite his father, knowing that Cosigna would use his wealth and power to erase the incident to avoid a scandal that would damage his political career. In one particularly formative incident, Palpatine, who was an avid amateur racer, hit and killed two pedestrians with a speeder. He never saw the inside of a courtroom for the incident, nor any lasting consequences due to his father's intervention. Palpatine himself was unfazed by the incident. It didn't bother him at all that he killed two people. To sum it up a bit more bluntly, as a teenager, Palpatine was a spoiled rich a-hole with daddy issues. By the time we see him in the films, he has changed a fair bit, but that privilege and unaccountability had a huge impact on how Palpatine came to see himself and his place in the galaxy. To quote Star Wars' Darth Plagueis, Palpatine's troubled past had seen him bounce from one private school to the next, following incidents of petty crime and offenses that would have landed a commoner in a correctional facility. Time and again, his father, who shared with his son a penchant for violence, had used his influence to rescue Palpatine and avoid the spectre of family scandals. To Plagueis, however, the youth's transgressions were only a further indication of his exceptionality. Here was a youth who had already risen above common morality and had judged himself unique enough to create an individual code of ethics. Because of his privilege, his resultant warped views of himself and his seemingly innate brilliance and cunning, Palpatine began to see himself as a superior being. He recognized that he could get away with anything because of his father's power and wealth, but he wholeheartedly believed that he deserved to get away with anything, that the rules of the galaxy didn't apply to him. He was a superior being, he believed, built different, unequaled and unstoppable, 
And even before he became aware of the Sith, he knew exactly what he wanted to do with his life, though he kept it to himself. To quote Star Wars Darth Plagueis again, What do you want to do, Palpatine, if the choice was yours and yours alone? The youth hesitated. I don't want to live as ordinary beings live. Plagueis regarded him. Do you fence yourself extraordinary? Palpatine seemed embarrassed by the question. I only meant that I want to live an extraordinary life. Make no apologies for your desires. Extraordinary in what way? Palpatine averted his eyes. Why are you holding back? If you're going to dream, then dream large. Plagueis paused, then added, You hinted that you had no interest in politics. Is that true? Palpatine firmed his lips. Not entirely. Plagueis came to a stop in the middle of the walkway. How deep does your interest go? To what position do you aspire? Republic Senator? Monarch of Naboo? Supreme Chancellor of the Republic? Palpatine glanced at him. You'll think less of me if I tell you. Now you underestimate me, as you do your father. Palpatine took a breath and continued. I want to be a force for change. His look hardened. I want to rule. Palpatine believed that he knew what was best for the galaxy, that he could see the solutions others could not. To him, they were so simple, and others lacked the intelligence, the will, or the courage to put them into action. He thought about the entire galaxy, but as a teen he was focused more on his homeworld of Naboo. At the time, Naboo was just beginning to achieve some measure of importance on the galactic stage, and the discovery of vast plasma reserves beneath Theed had the potential to make it an economic power player. Many outside interests, the Huts and the intergalactic banking clan among them, thought the same. Naboo, which was not yet a Republic member, wanted to leverage these resources to join the Republic fully, a move Cosigna Palpatine bitterly opposed. His son didn't feel the same way, however. Palpatine thought integration with the Republic was a logical choice, and when his father tried to sabotage Naboo's pro-Republic candidate for the monarchy to stop Republic integration, Palpatine fought back by secretly leaking valuable information to his father's political rivals. This attracted the attention of a banking clan executive named Ego Damask, who, at length, recruited the boy to spy on his father and leak anything else he uncovered. But the Mun Palpatine knew as Ego Damask secretly went by another name, Darth Plagueis. Plagueis, at the time, had only recently killed his master, and he worked with Palpatine not just to further his political goals, but also to test him to see if the boy would make a good apprentice. Plagueis wasn't even sure Palpatine was Force-sensitive, but he felt drawn to the boy, and he could sense that he had a power to him, buried deep behind the masks Palpatine wore to fit into Naboo society. Of course, Plagueis' instincts were right. Palpatine did indeed have the Force within him. Palpatine himself was aware of his power, and his family suspected, though they never spoke of it. He kept the Force bottled up within him though, building walls that made it hard for other Force sensitives to detect his true nature. It was something he was naturally gifted at, perhaps because he already had to do the same thing with his personality. Few understood just how dangerous Palpatine could be. It was only when the young man was truly angry that a glimpse of his true power could be felt. To quote, Palpatine's fury buffeted Plagueis. Blossoms growing along the sides of pathway folded in on themselves and their pollinators began to buzz in agitation. 4D reacted as well, wobbling on its feet as if in the grip of a powerful electromagnet. Had this human truly been born of flesh and blood parents? Plagueis asked himself. Inside, this was who Palpatine really was, a swirling mass of rage and hatred for everything and everyone around him. He kept it carefully bottled up, but that would only work for so long. It was only a matter of time before he snapped and the power of the force within him was unleashed. Once Plagueis realized this, it didn't take him long to make this happen. By that point, Cosigna had become aware that his son was in league with the one he knew as Hego Damask, and he told the Mun to stay away from his son, at once fearful and jealous of the influence Damask had over the boy. All Plagueis had to do was meet with Palpatine one more time, in open view of Cosigna's spies, to make the inevitable happen. What happened next is best rendered in Palpatine's own words. The human took a deep breath. My father arrived unexpectedly on Chandrila. He had me taken from the youth program vessel and brought to our ship. My mother and siblings were already aboard. 
After the launch, I learned that I was being taken to Chomel Minor. Just as you warned. We fell into an argument. Then, I'm not sure what happened. Tell me what happened, Vegas demanded. I killed them, Palpatine snarled back. I killed them, even the guards. He goes into more depth later in the novel. Palpatine raised his clawed hands. I executed them with these and with the power of my mind. I became a storm, magister, a weapon strong enough to warp bulkheads and hurl bodies across cabin spaces. I was death itself. Plagueis sat tall in the chair in genuine astonishment. He could see Palpatine now in all his dark glory. Anger and murder had pulled down the walls he had raised perhaps since infancy to safeguard his secret. But there was no concealing it now. The force was powerful in him. Bottled up for 17 standard years, his innate power had finally burst forth and could never again be stopped. All the years of repression, guiltless crimes, raw emotion bubbling forth, toxic to anyone who dared touch or taste it. With his bare hands and the power of the Force, Palpatine bludgeoned his father to death, strangled his mother, crushed the guards, and slaughtered his brothers and sisters. He gave in to the dark side as a matter of instinct, and it changed him forever. Palpatine was born to be Sith. He was a psychopath. He didn't just not care about others, he hated them so much that he enjoyed their sufferings. Guilt, love, and morality were alien to him, and there was no line he wouldn't cross, no cruelty that was too horrible for him to perform. All he cared about was his personal power and shaping the galaxy into the form he wished it to take. Palpatine had no reservations, none of the things the Sith would consider weakness. These weren't things he had to learn either. They were who he was and who he had always been. To quote Star Wars Darth Plagueis again, Kersinger exhaled deeply. I know that you are of my blood because I had you tested just to be certain. But in truth, I don't know where you came from, who or what you're actually descended from. He glared at Palpatine. Yes, there it is. That glower I've been on the receiving end for 17 long years. As if you want to murder me. Murder has always been in your thoughts, hasn't it? You've merely been waiting for someone to grant you permission to act. A darkness came over Palpatine's face. I don't need anyone's permission. Precisely, you're an animal at heart. King of the beasts, father, Palpatine said. To the Sith, Palpatine's slaughter of his family was much more significant than a gruesome, violent outburst. It was a rite of passage, the final plunge required to truly become a lord of the Sith. The Sith embraced the dark side wholeheartedly, devoting themselves entirely to their mad quests for power without reservations. The Sith saw reservations, especially caring for others in any form, as a weakness, unbecoming of true Sith. Thus, those who wished to become Sith would have to commit a murder in cold blood, preferably of someone close to them who kept them emotionally grounded. Palpatine's slaughter of his family was considered the fulfillment of this rite, but the massacre didn't have the impact on Palpatine this practice typically had. The truth was that he had never cared about anyone. He didn't have anybody close to him, anyone whose deaths he would care about. Palpatine was born a Sith, steeped in the dark side long before he met Darth Plagueis. The massacre about the family ship just made Palpatine realize who and what he really was. It made him finally lay claim to the name he had been born to accept, Darth Sidious. For 11 years, Sidious trained under Darth Plagueis in secret while publicly going into local Chommel sector politics. On Naboo, everyone between the ages of 12 and 20 was expected to do some time in public service, giving Sidious an easy entry point for the local political sphere. After turning 20, he simply chose to remain in public service, working his way through various local positions. He stuck to low-profile offices so that he and Plagueis could slip off to train on a regular basis, and it was only once Plagueis deemed his apprentice's training sufficiently complete that Palpatine began to seek out more prominent appointments. He became an ambassador in Naboo's delegation to the Galactic Senate, and then, after orchestrating the assassination of Senator Kim, Palpatine became the senator for the Chommel sector. On the Sith side of things, Plagueis slowly let Sidious in on the Sith's teaching, history, and agenda. 
He made his apprentice aware of the Sith Grand Plan and his belief that its fulfillment was fast approaching, and he also taught Sidious about the Rule of Two. The Plagueis also alleged that the Rule of Two had become outdated, at least in the form that Bane envisioned it. Plagueis believed that there should only be two Sith, but that he and Sidious should act as partners, not rivals, once Sidious' training was complete, as he believed that both of them would live forever. Plagueis, as some of you may know, was obsessed with immortality, like a great many Sith, and to that end, he spent decades studying midichlorians and looking for ways to live forever. Around the time Palpatine became senator for the Trommel sector, Plagueis began to focus exclusively on his research, leaving the execution of the Grand Plan to Sidious. He even allowed Sidious to adopt and train Darth Maul, reasoning that, since Maul was to be trained as a Sith assassin and not a Sith Lord, he wasn't a true Sith and thus didn't count against his revised Rule of Two. Plagueis and Sidious sent Maul out to do their dirty work, all while Plagueis worked toward eternal life and Sidious worked on the Grand Plan. As Palpatine, Sidious made a great many friends and allies, becoming acquainted with other senators, powerful business executives, and even Jedi. Sidious did the work of the Sith in plain view of the Jedi, something he and his master derived great satisfaction in. That brings us back to what we touched on at the beginning, the many faces Sidious shielded himself with, the personalities he constructed to manipulate others. As Palpatine, Sidious built a life for himself to live, establishing himself as a kindly man with a passion for art, timid seeming but politically resolute, someone that everyday folk could feel comfortable with but still openly enjoyed the cultural hallmarks of the noble class he was born into. Almost no one in the Senate saw past this mask, not while the Republic lasted, and nor did the Jedi. Palpatine used the technique he had learned as a child to hide his strength in the Force from the Jedi, and he was so skilled at it that he was able to develop close friendships with two of them, Joros Seboeth and Ronha Kim, without ever coming under suspicion. His friendship with Kim is an even more impressive feat when you consider the fact that Sidious ordered the murder of Kim's own father. It's easy to chalk Sidious' skill in hiding his true nature from others as just strength in the Force, but it was more than that. It was part of who he was. He was able to adopt these alternate personalities perfectly, creating alternate selves so complex that no one ever thought to question them, and he did it all as second nature. Manipulation and deception were his default state, and he was so skilled at this trickery that he fooled not just the Senate, not just the Jedi, but his own Sith Master as well. Plagueis believed that the plan Sidious was executing, which would see Palpatine made Supreme Chancellor, a clone army created to crush the Jedi, and ultimately the Republic transformed into an empire, was his idea. In truth, however, Sidious had his own plan, and he planted it in Plagueis' head, subtly manipulating his own master. Just as his guise as Senator Palpatine was just a mask, the Persona Sidious war for Plagueis was also a lie. Over the years, Plagueis and Sidious had begun to act as partners per Plagueis' vision, and by the time of the Battle of Naboo, Plagueis wholeheartedly believed that the Rule of Two was a thing of the past, no longer fearing that Sidious would ever try to kill him. But this was another deception. Sidious hated his master, and he never gave up on killing him and claiming the title of Dark Lord for himself. 32 years before the Battle of Yavin, Plagueis and Sidious orchestrated the Battle of Naboo to propel Senator Palpatine to the position of Supreme Chancellor of the Republic. The night before Palpatine's ascension, the two had a private celebration on Coruscant during which Plagueis drank great quantities of wine and, at length, fell asleep for the first time in 20 years. He let his guard down, not realizing that, with the title of Supreme Chancellor his, Sidious no longer had any need for his master. To quote two final passages from Star Wars' Darth Plagueis, a look of sinister purpose contorted Sidious's face. Again, his eyes darted around the room, and the dark side whispered, Your election assured, the sun guards absent, Plagueis unsuspecting and asleep, and he moved in a blur. Crackling from his fingertips, a web of blue lightning ground itself on the moon's breathing device. Plagueis' eyes snapped open, the force gathering in him like a storm, but he stopped short of defending himself. This being who had survived assassinations and killed countless opponents merely gazed at Sidious, 
until it struck him that Plagueis was challenging him. Confident that he couldn't be killed and in denial that he was slowly suffocating, he might have been simply experimenting with himself, actually courting death to put it in its place. Momentarily taken aback, Sidious stood absolutely still. Was Plagueis so self-deluded as to believe that he had achieved immortality? The question lingered only for a moment, then Sidious unleashed another tangle of lightning, drawing more deeply on the dark side than he ever had. As he murdered Plagueis with lightning and telekinesis, Sidious revealed to his master who he had truly been all along. You may be wondering, when did I begin to change? The truth is, I haven't changed. As we've clouded the minds of the Jedi, I clouded yours. Never once did I have any intention of sharing power with you. I needed to learn from you, no more, no less. To learn all of your secrets, which I trusted you would eventually reveal. But what made you think I would need you after that? Vanity, perhaps. Your sense of self-importance. You've been nothing more than a pawn in a game played by a genuine master. The Sith Ari. That last bit was a reference to an ancient Sith legend very similar to the prophecy of the Chosen One. The legend of the Sith Ari foretold the coming of a perfect being, free of limitations, who would rule the Sith and destroy them. As we've discussed in the past, the prophecy was about Darth Bane, but as he triumphed over Plagueis, Sidious also claimed the title. He wasn't the real Sith Ari, as we just mentioned, but he was every bit as significant, as Darth Plagueis realized far too late. Darth Sidious was the dark side incarnate. Not in a literal sense, mind you. But beneath the many masks, that was who Sidious truly was. An abomination against nature. An empty, misanthropic hunger for power with no center, no purpose beyond a vague sense of self. The ideology of the dark side, especially of the Sith, was deeply flawed, and time and time again it fell subject to a paradox as exemplified by the likes of Ulic Keldroma, Darth Nihilus, Darth Sion, and later Darth Vader. The dark side was so dangerous and so alluring because the easiest way to succumb to it was through passion, through strong emotions that drove force sensitives to act on their conscious desires, in contravention to the will of the force. Often, emotions like love were what led force sensitives to the dark side, but the dark side demanded that its adherents sacrifice everything to it and past a certain point, the very things that lead people to the dark side became obstacles that darksiders would have to dispose of. We touched on this, the trap of the Sith, in our long video about Anakin Skywalker. In many cases, the dark side destroyed its own adherents, who became inhuman and megalomaniacal, caring about nothing apart from their quest for unlimited power, which they wanted for power's sake. Going far enough down this path tended to crush the wills of most darksiders who, in their quests for power, always destroyed whatever they had originally wanted that power for. But Darth Sidious was different. He was one of the rare few that was born for the dark side, who had always been inhuman, megalomaniacal, and only cared about power for power's sake. He was, as we stated at the start of the video, a black hole in the force, draining and destroying the entire galaxy to feed his mania. He was the perfect Sith, and once he had learned everything he needed from Plagueis, he was complete. After killing Plagueis, Darth Sidious took Count Dooku as his new apprentice. The two engineered the Clone Wars, the rise of the Empire, and the destruction of the Jedi. Sidious had Dooku killed and replaced by Anakin Skywalker, who he named Darth Vader before manipulating the Senate into proclaiming him the Emperor of the Galaxy. By the end of 19 BBY, the galaxy was under his total control via the Imperial military machine, the Jedi were in hiding and nearly extinct, and to his mind, the threat of the Chosen One had been eliminated, as Darth Vader had been broken and submitted to his service. Sidious was triumphant. As Emperor, Darth Sidious reveled in his power and victory, but of course, it was never enough for him. He had ambitions beyond the Sith Grand Plan. He dreamed of learning the secrets of immortality and to expand his empire beyond the galaxy, to become emperor of the universe. He had been messed up in the head before, but his victory and the worship he received as emperor confirmed all of the delusions of grandeur he'd held since childhood, and it sent him right off to the deep end. He developed a new personal Sith ideology to replace Bane's rule of two, 
which Sidious believed was fulfilled with the rise of the empire. Sidious's ideology, the rule of one, decreed that he alone would be the Dark Lord of the Sith, the ultimate, insurmountable embodiment of the dark side who would rule the galaxy forever. He had no need to train any to replace him, only to serve him, for as Sidious saw it, there would never be a need for a successor. During the time of the Empire, a few widows actually worshipped Palpatine as some sort of demigod, and this was a pretty accurate reflection of how Sidious viewed himself. He had always seen himself as superior and deserving of absolute rule, and his victories confirmed that in his eyes. Sidious actually believed that his rule was beneficial for the galaxy and that without his superior intellect to guide the Empire, sentient life would be worse off. Despite his political skills, Sidious mostly left the work of actually running the Empire to the military, leading to a misconception among some that Emperor Palpatine was just a puppet of the warlords and military industrial titans of the Empire, shut out from the world in his palaces. But through the dark side, Sidious's rule was absolute. His keen powers of foresight and telepathy allowed him to keep a tight grip on the Empire, even while he focused his efforts on honing his dark side powers even further. In secrecy, Darth Sidious became the most powerful Sith Lord to ever live, harnessing the raw power of fury and hatred to warp the universe around him, creating monsters and immensely destructive force storms at will. His newfound power and his seemingly flawless foresight only confirmed his delusion of omnipotence. Of course, Darth Sidious wasn't omnipotent. He was powerful, to be sure, but his arrogance and his pride far exceeded his ability. It was only a matter of time before it all came back to bite him in the ass. Sidious made a number of mistakes, but there were three in particular that doomed him. The first was his long-standing belief in the inferiority and incapability of ordinary people, a relic of his aristocratic upbringing that his Sith training had made even stronger. But the ordinary people of the galaxy were far more determined and competent than Sidious allowed himself to believe, and the rise of the Rebel Alliance proved it. The galaxy became fed up with the Empire's tyrannical rule, and when it began to shake off its chains, not even the full might of the Imperial military could keep the people at bay forever. But Sidious refused to see this. He consistently downplayed the Rebel Alliance, and even as he ordered his fleet commanders to wage uncompromising war against it, the Rebels only really got his full attention when he learned that one of them bore the name Skywalker. When that happened, he became determined to turn Luke Skywalker to the dark side like he had turned his father. As he told Vader, Luke's fall was certain. He foresaw it, and his foresight was never wrong. That was Sidious's next mistake. Both of these mistakes led Sidious to orchestrate the Battle of Endor, a trap that he believed would crush the Rebel Alliance and turn Luke Skywalker to the dark side all in one fell swoop. Secretly, he intended to have Luke replace Vader as his apprentice, just as Vader had replaced Dooku. During the battle, Luke came before the Emperor, as Sidious had foreseen, and he battled and defeated Vader, as Sidious had foreseen. But as we all know, Luke refused to kill his father and become a Sith Lord, instead asserting that he was a Jedi like his father before him. Sidious was enraged at the boy's refusal to bend to his will, enraged at his failure to see it coming, and above all, he was enraged by the event's inescapable implication, that he wasn't all-powerful after all. Sidious channeled his rage into a barrage of force lightning, intending to kill Luke as he had once killed Darth Plagueis, but in doing so, he made his third and final mistake. He took the obedience of Darth Vader for granted. By the time he realized his error on that one, he was halfway down a reactor shaft. Now in both Legends and Canon, Darth Sidious returned after the Battle of Endor by making use of a series of cloned bodies that he had prepared as a contingency. But truthfully, Sidious really was destroyed at Endor, and his return in both timelines was nothing more than inertia. A twisted being's final, stubborn, pointless attempt to regain the power he had lost. Endor shattered the delusions that Sidious built his world around, disproving his arrogant beliefs of his innate superiority and invincibility. At Endor, he lost, and his defeat destroyed all the power he had built, everything that he lived for. It restored balance to the Force. Sidious was the dark side, and as the dark side was crushed by the sacrifice of Anakin Skywalker, so was he. 
Darth Sidious was the avatar of the dark side, the greatest enemy that the Force ever faced. He was the ultimate Sith Lord, incredibly intelligent, tremendously powerful, patient and manipulative, and cruel. But no matter how powerful a Sith Lord he was, he could not prevail against the ultimate truth of the Star Wars universe. The truth that he, inhuman and entirely selfish as he was, could never understand. To quote the final lines of the Revenge of the Sith novelization, The dark is generous, and it is patient, and it always wins. But in the heart of its strength lies its weakness. One lone candle is enough to hold it back. Love is more than a candle. Love can ignite the stars. Well, there you have it. All that's really left to answer as far as Palpatine's identity is concerned is what his original first name was. In canon, his name was Sheev, but it was never revealed in Legends, though George Lucas once said his real name was Richard M. Nixon in a pitch meeting. In either case, we completely understand why Palpatine ditched it. Once again, massive thank you to Pixel Starships for supporting the channel. I really do think it's an extremely fun game combined with an awesome development team, so with that said, don't forget to check the link in the description below.